Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session. I hope each of us had a good weekend. Okay. As still our students are logging in, can we start the session with a word of prayer? Let me pray. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you, we praise you, we love you, we honor you, we glorify your name, Lord. We submit ourselves in this day, the session, especially in your hand. Lord, we pray that you will minister to each one of us, you will teach. Lord, I pray that you will cover me and you will put your words into me. And you will speak to each one of us, Lord, with clarity, with the insight from your word. And you will give us your understanding, Lord. As we study your word, O oh Father, Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you will minister to each one of us in the place where we are, Lord. Thank you, Father. I surrender ourselves and this session in your hand. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 So today we're going to study on the intertestamental period. Uh, Yes, we are going to see uh, the different types of error that was present in that 400 silent period. So during the 400 years, the intertestinal period especially, God's people experienced a significant challenges and a spiritual decline. So this 400-year period was characteri characterized by six historical errors. So what are they? They were the Persian era, which ruled from 397 BC to 336 BC. And then we had the Greek era from about 336 to 323 BC. And then the Egyptian era, about 323 to 198 BC. And then we had the Syrian era, and then the Maccabean era, and then the Roman era with the time period. Well, the Syrian era was 198 to 165 BC, and the Maccabean era was from 165 to 63 BC. And then the Roman era was from 63 BC to about 4 BC. Well, we can study what happened with the Persian era era. Uh, this era actually dates Persian conquering the Babylon in 536 BC. Yes, we're going to study, I'm not going to go deep into the history, but then a few information that each of us needed for us to understand the significance on each era. We'll cover them. Yes. So as it continued into the early years of this intertestamental period, we see that first thing that the Persia contributed to the people of Israel as a foreign policy. We need to remember that the history of the people of Israel, like once in the Solomon uh, uh, goes off the scene, the kingdom, as in the last class we studied, after the Solomon rule, the kingdom was divided into two that is the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. The Northern Kingdom eventually was called as Israel and the Southern Kingdom was known as Judah. And we know the capital city of these places, the Northern Kingdom Israel, in Israel, the capital was Samaria in the Southern Kingdom, the capital was Judah. Okay. The Northern Kingdom, the capital city was Judah and there it was Samaria. Well, the northern kingdom of Israel was scattered all over. What happened was the northern kingdom was conquered by the Assyrian and the southern kingdom was conquered by the Babylonian. And what happened after they conquered these two places, they took the Israelites as captives and they scattered them throughout the region, wherever the Syrian empire was. And the same goes with the Babylonian, wherever the Babylonian, where they scattered the Israelites there. So wherever the settlement were there, so Persia eventually, uh, you know, conquers even the Babylonian. And when they do, uh, their foreign policy was to let the people of Judah return to their homeland. 
So when uh, uh, under the Persian rule, uh, some of the Israelites returned back to Jerusalem with the leadership of Ezra. And later, again, there was a certain batch of exile returned back through the leadership of Nehemiah. So we see that God used Persia to deliver Israel from the Babylonian captivity. We also see that when we study the book of Daniel. And this allowed the Jewish exiles to return back to their land for what? They rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem and also they rebuilt the temple of Jerusalem and they restored back the worship at the temple. <laughs> Bluetooth mode. Uh, uh, something happened. One second, please. How do I unpin? One second, please. Sorry about it. I by mistake clicked on the pin for Abu Bakr and now I released it. Okay. So what happened? So these significant things that happened during the Persia, let the people of Israel do and it all related to the foreign policy. So about 100 years after the close of the Old Testament from the book of Malachi to the New Testament, there was a complete silence. And during this season, we see uh, the Judea continue to be under the Persian territory, under the uh, governor of Syria with the high priest, exercising a, me a measure of civil authority. So the Jewish people were allowed to observe their uh, religious tradition without any uh, governmental interference. So we see, and later we see, uh, uh, the Persian attitude was a little bit tolerant about the Jewish uh, worship related to their worship, their traditional style of uh, following. But later, the Jewish people were pretty much uh, left undisturbed by the Persian during this period. And what happened in the time of the Greek era? So between 334 BC and 331 BC, Alexander the Great defeated the Persian king Darius III. So there was a three consecutive battle and that gave him the control of the land of the Persian Empire. So what happened now? The Alexander the Great has been regarded by the historians as the greatest conqueror of all times. And he was far away uh, from the central figure of the brief period. And he conquered the Persia, the Babylon, the Palestine, the Syria, the Egypt as well, and as some of the Western India. Although he only reigned over the Greece for about 13 years. And he died at a very young age when he was about 33 years old. But he left a great influence which even lived after his death. They cherished the desires of Alexander that he found to be the worldwide empire unified with a, a common language. There should be a single custom and a civilization. Well, what we see under his rule was a great influ influence about the Western, uh, Western world to speak and study the Greek language. And this process was called as Hellenization, including the adoption of the Greek culture and their religion in all parts of the world. So what we see here is the Hellenism became so popular and it persisted and was encouraged even through the Roman era and the New Testament times. So it was Alexander's goal to bring a Greek culture to the land he had conquered. And he wished to create a world united by the Greek language and thinking. So this is a very crucial element that Greece brought to the table. 
So what did the Greece do? They bought a, uh, they they made sure that there was a common language, and a, there's a common religious impact on the people. And they want to be implemented among the places where they ruled and reigned. So there was a faithful Jews resisted the strong influence of this pagan polytheism. Although the Greek language was sufficiently widespread by 270 BC, but it resulted in bringing about a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, into the Greek translation. And this was known as Septuagint. With this, we will move on to the next era, that is the Egyptian era. I hope we are getting it. Are we getting it? I'm not going too fast. I'm going it slow. And I'm giving the main information that we could get from each era. Is it OK, or am I going too fast? No, ma'am, it is fine. It is fine. Thank you. Thank you for confirming, Sid. OK, now the third one, we are studying on the Egyptian era, which was between 323 BC to 198 BC. When the Alexander the Great died in 323 BC, the Greek Empire became divided into four segments under his four generals. So under the Alexander, there were four generals. One was Ptolemy, the second was Lysimus, and the third was Cassander, and the fourth was Selenus. Now, Ptolemy sought a the first of the Ptolemaic dynasty received Egypt and soon dominated the nearby Israel. So he dealt severely with the Jews at the first. But toward the end of his reign and on the rule of the Ptolemy Philadelphus, who was his successor, the Jews were treated favorably. And it was in this season or in this time, the Septuagint was authorized. That is the translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Well, the policy of this toleration followed by the Ptolemies, uh, by which the Judaism or the Hellenism coexisted. They both coexisted peacefully. But at the same time, it was very dangerous for the faith of the Jews. What happened? Gradually, during this period, Jewish people started to worship the influence to become more external than the internal worship. So this was very dangerous for the Jews. So there were two religious parties emerged during this time. Who are they? pro-Syrian Hellenism party and the other was Orthodox Jews. So there was always a struggle between these two groups. And this resulted to the polarization of the Jews along the other areas, that is the political, cultural and the religious sectors. Well, we also see the Jews had prospered until uh, you know the near end of the uh, Ptolemaic dynasty, when the conflict between the Egypt and Syria escalated. Well, what we see here is Israel was again caught in the middle. When the Syrian defeated the Egypt, the Battle of Panion in 198 BC, Judea was conquered by Syria. Now we move on to the next era. That is the Syrian era, which took place between 198 BC to 165 BC. Now, what happened under this era? Under the rule of the Antiochus III, the great and the successor, Seleucus, Philopater, Philo, Philopater, yeah. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Kindly excuse me. Well, the Jews came under the control of Syria. What happened here is they treated Israelites very harshly. They were rude to them. They, went, uh, they didn't allow them to worship in the way they had to. 
and there was a local rule under the high priest and always reasonably well until the hellenizing party decided to have a person person they favored so it was jason who replaced the high priest favored by the orthodox jews and they brought this about by bribing celulicus successor celulicus successor who was antiochus so this set up a political conflict that finally brought antiochus to jerusalem and he was very angry and in 168 bc he set up about you know uh, he went he went about to go and destroy in every distinct jewish faith he forbidded all the sacrifices and he outlawed all the rites of circumcision and he canceled the observance of sabbath and he went ahead and he also stopped the offering of sacrifices in the temple and he uh, he also uh, disallowed the feast which they celebrated yearly additionally he also uh, destroyed the nearby uh uh it destroyed the nearby copies of the hebrew bible so jews were forced um, he also went to an extent of forcing the jews to eat pork or un uh, religious food which was under uh, which was against their belief and also he forced them to uh, make sacrifice to their idols to the pagan gods and his final act of all these was uh, you know uh, and also he went towards uh, desecrating the holy place by building an altar in the temple and offering the sacrifice for the god of zeus so many jews died in this season due to persecution perhaps we also see a reminder of god's way of working with man is needed at this point we see man seeking god's help at the season he creates or allows these type of desperate situation and then he makes the man call unto the god the creator to help same way sometimes when we face the situation these days isn't it we also see that there are some desperate situation that has been created in our life in our city in our country where it is beyond our man's ability and we see god to intervene to help us the same thing happened then and we see how god was simply setting the stage for the coming of his deliverer jesus the only messiah so he was silent but he was working behind the scene and we see that during this time god's plan everything was in god's plan there was nothing hidden god was not wondering what should i do now no everything was in god's plan but there was silence but still everything was according to god's plan with this we will move on to the next era that is the maccabean era from 165 bc to 63 bc we see an elderly priest called uh, uh, matthias he was from the house of hasman who lived with his five sons in a village near northwest of jerusalem and when a syrian official tried to enforce uh, the pagan sacrifice in that village matthias revolted and he killed the renegade jew who, who tried or who offered a sacrifice he slew the syrian official and fled to the mountains with his family he fled and then what happened the when he fled the very act of this matthias and his sons made some of the faithful jews to join him and they also went along with him to the mountain and the history says that one of the most noble demonstration of the holy zealous to honor god was found in matthias the very act of him 
So after the death of Matthias, three of his sons carried on the Maccabean revolt. In so the three sons were the first one was Judas, and he ruled from 166 to 160 BC, and then Jonathan is another son who ruled from 160 to 142 BC, and the last son was Simon who ruled from 142 to 134 BC. And these three men had such success that by 165 BC they had retaken Jerusalem cleansed the temple and restored the biblical worship. And this event commemorated even today as the Feast of Dedication, and which is also known in the Jewish culture as Hanukkah, which we also see that uh, in the book of John chapter 10, verse 22, where Jesus was entering the temple during the Feast of Dedication when we read that John chapter 10, verse 22. So we see that uh, though they were fighting against the Syrian continued in outline area, but the Jewish people finally received their independence during the leadership of the uh, Simon who ruled in 142 BC. And uh, under his rule, the Jewish had the freedom to worship and practice their religious custom. And there were also two parties who coexisted during this time. Those were the Pharisees and Sadducees. With that, we will move on to the next era, that is the Roman era, which took place from 63 BC to 4 BC. So the independence of the Jews ended in 63 BC, when a Roman general called Pompey conquered Syrian and ended Israel and entered Israel. What happened when Ati, when Aristobulus, second of Israel, who claimed to be the king of Israel, locked Pompey out of Jerusalem, and the Roman leader, he took the city by force, and by doing so, he reduced the size of Judah. So what happened? Antipas was appointed as a procurator of Judah by Julius Caesar in 47 BC. As some of us uh, will recall that Antipas' son was Herod. Eventually, he became the king of the Jews around 40 BC. Although Herod the Great, as he was called during that time, planned and carried out to build onto the new temple in Jerusalem. He was a devoted Hellenist and hated Hasmonean family until he went and killed the descendants of Hasmoneans, including his own wife, the granddaughter of John. Hike, ha Hire Canis, and as well as his two of his own sons he killed. Remember, the, this Herod was the man who was on the throne when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So we, we should know like how his rule would have been when he can kill his own wife and two sons. For him, the political power was very important. So during this era, we see the Pharisees believed in the strict adherence to the scripture, that is the written law, and as well to the misna, that is the oral law, which sought to apply the written law to destroy uh, uh, written law in everyday life. Whereas the Pharisees were strongly connected with the scribes with the Sadducees. Uh, well, the Sadducees were strongly related to the high priest. The priest seemed to have tended toward the more of the social, political, and earthly aspects of their position. Well, this position was obviously more attractive toward the wealthy, social-minded Jewish leaders. So we see the rule of Romans 
And under this rule, among the Jewish people, there were two, two parties, that is the Pharisees and Sadducees, and their rule continued even in time of Jesus. So lastly, the Roman uh, uh, brought in uh, 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 many uh, many advantage um, uh, during their era. So what did they brought? They brought the law. They brought peace among the city. They also stabilized the government rule. They brought in a system among their rule, and also uh, they also brought slavery. And last. We see that the Romans uh, brought the roads. They built the roads all over the empire, um, and they were freeway builders of their days. And what happened was these roads connected the empire to uh, together, and that was very important where to spread the gospel. This helped the mission of the disciples to carry the gospel into all the world. So God used each of these various nations to fill up the time and also prepare the way for the Messiah who was to come, the one that they had been hoping and waiting for. We also see in John chapter 1, verse 10 to 11, we see that when, but when he came, the Messiah whom they were waiting and hoping for, when he came, they did not recognize him or receive him. So with this, we just went towards the 400 years of the silent period. But it was God's purpose. It was God's purpose for them to remain silent because God did send many prophets before, many messengers before, but people never heeded their voice. So what did God do? God remained silent. They also called us the dark period. But even during this time, though God did not send any messenger, but God was working behind the scene. He was just paving the path for the Messiah to come, to send the messenger. That was John the Baptist in the New Testament. He comes. He comes. And after that, the Messiah is on the way. So with this, we can move on to the New Testament. That is um, the four Gospels. We can inter uh, we can discuss on the introduction of the four Gospels. But before that, I would like to know if there's anyone who would like to share, add on to what we said. Please feel free. What we discussed, you can add on or share something. Class, please feel free. It shouldn't be like very monotonous. Please feel free. You can unmute and speak. Yes, please go ahead, Nikki. Uh, hi, Pastor. Then I just wanted to know. I, I've always been confused by the four hundred years of silence of why God chose to do that. Um, but I wanted to know if there's any other biblical reference way. Maybe is there any reference or connection to the time when they were in Egypt or any? Any other kind of connection or logically I'm not able to make any sense of why there was silence and how the people went about in that period as such. Thanks, thanks, Nikki. That's a good question. But then, yes, God, uh, there's no scripture or so between the 400, but then the timeline from the book of Malachi to, to the New Testament. You know, the history says there's a timeline and then there's a 400. And exactly if you see, uh, the history says 425 years of silence. But then, you know, there, there's always a variance between the time period. They say some says 400, some says 425. So exactly uh, they they just say 400 years but then there was silence because the people did not heed to the prophet's voice god did send many prophets we see isaiah jeremiah uh, daniel and many other prophets were there malachi amos all the major and minor prophets that we studied in the old testament they were telling the jews in the exile or people who were uh, uh, left out in the region. God sent these prophets for them to repent, come out from the pagan culture. But then people never heard. 
heeded the voice of these prophets. In fact, they also stoned them, they rebuked them, they called them the mad people, they rejected them. Literally, we see Jeremiah cry and weep out, uh, you know, to let them know to repent and come out. But they never heeded. And we also see when we studied the book of Ezekiel, you know how he enacted himself. He tied his hands, he tied his legs to show that you are in bondage. You need to come out of it. But then people never heeded their voice. So that is how it was. They were so much uh, uh, deaf to the voice of God. But later, uh, you know, when we study the history of this 400 period, when People literally were seeking for the voice of God through the prophets. But then there were no prophets during this time. There were no prophets. God stopped talking to people through prophets. Malachi was the last. So what happened? Some of the people, uh, when, you, when we study the history, we see that some people say that so much we have sinned, our sin has grown so much that it has made our ears deaf to the voice of God or it has made God stop talking to us anymore through man. So this was the extent that the sin had grown among the people and people uh, started realizing that. Even when they were going through different errors under the different rule, yes, Jewish people, were, uh, you know, they had their own set of trouble. They were persecuted. They were ups and downs in their life. Yes, there were certain time they had freedom, certain time they didn't have freedom. They could not worship God. You know, they had to go different season in each rule. But each rule paved a path for the man to seek God, to cry out to God, so that when God, when God talks to them or when God sends a messenger, they will hear, they will repent. Because God tried doing it many times among, uh, through the major and minor prophets, but then the people did not hear them. So what happened during this season? Sometimes God remained silent so that People will realize and they will cry out to God. And now, this time when God speaks, they will hear. They will hear. And yes, that's how this 400 years paved a path for the Messiah to come. And before the Messiah could come, God sends the messenger. That's John the Baptist. So, that's how it was prepared. I hope this answered your question, Nikki. There's no actual verse or any scripture of what happened in 400 years, but that's how, because it was silent, that's how this 400 years have been said. It is silent from the book of Malachi to the start of the New Testament was 400 and change years, and it was a silent period or the dark period, they say. Yes, Pastor, thank you. Just a quick Thing. Is this why some people also say that prophecy is no longer in the New Testament? Is this the reference they give? Like I've heard some people say it. But I mean, I, I believe in prophecy, just clarify. <laughs> just... No, I didn't understand. What was that? Sorry. No, some people say that prophecy and miracles and all were dead. Uh, what will happen only in the Old Testament? I've heard some old preachers say that. Is, is this the reference they usually give because of this? Or... I'm not sure, Nikki, okay, what no exactly problem. they were comparing to or relating to. Exactly. Okay. I don't know. I've not heard anything as such. So I'm not mm -hmm. able to say exactly what exactly they were pointing out to. But then all the Old Testament prophecies, that's what we will be studying when we study uh, the introduction of the four gospel of the New Testament, that all the prophecies of Jesus from the Old Testament way fulfilled in the New Testament through Jesus. Everything. Well, thank you. Thank you. So thank much. you. Thank you. Thank you. So any other questions?
or anything that you would like to add on? See, I've not gone into deep history of each one because it becomes too much of theory. And what is required for us to understand what would have happened in the intertestamental period is what I shared. But then uh, you're free for more understanding because in our class, we have different students. Uh, so to cater to everyone, I've just taken up the important points. But then if somebody is interested in more of social and would like to know in depth the background, uh, I would request, recommend you all to please do a research and learn more, yes, and uh, so that you get a greater and deeper understanding on each error. And yes, um, I have a that... question. Yes, yes, please, John. Um, so we discussed about certain eras which uh, occurred during the intertestamental period. And is that the reason why the New Testament was written in Greek or was the New Testament written in Hebrew also? Okay. One thing we see that uh, the New Testament was written in Greek because uh, the Greek has well established by then and they had the common language. They also translated the Hebrew of Old Testament into Greek at certain period we discussed when we were sharing. And yes, the New Testament was written in Greek because the common language was well established as Greek because of Alexander the Great. And yeah. later, so, so yes. the speaking language was Aramic uh, and Aramic. It was written. Yes, yeah. yes. So even when we see Jesus spoke Aramic. Right. Speaking language was Aramic, but when it was written, it was written in Greek. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I'm back. Yes. Is is my voice clear or is it breaking? It's Remember, clear, it's very clear. Okay, it's thank, clear. You. thank you. Yes, sometimes because of the network or poor connection, sometimes it breaks. Well, if there's anything as such, you can please let me know. Okay, anyone would like to add on because the time is up? We have another 10 minutes. I don't think in 10 minutes I can start the introduction to the gospel. Anyone would like to share? Add on. And we can study on the introduction to the New Testament or to the four gospels tomorrow. Okay, so if anyone have studied through these error, would you like to add some point? Okay, I understand that you're okay. Was there any question, anything from the class that you would like to? Yes, Brother Lubega, please go ahead. It is a question. Yes, please. Is it true that um, that guy they call was it anti 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 course the fourth went ahead even to slaughter pig in the in the temple. Uh, Antichus, there was a rule. See, uh, just give me a minute, please. See, um, yes, you're right. His full name was, I was just searching for his full name. His full name was, um, no, uh, they, uh, 
Seleucius. Seleucius was a successor of Antiochus Epiphanes. And under his political conflict, where he brought in this uh, slaughtering of pig in the temple and he forced the Jews to uh, eat the pork and he made them to sacrifice to their pagan god. So it was Seleucius who was the successor of Antiochus Ep Epiphanes, Epiphanes. Lubika, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much, Pastor. Thank you, thank you. We see another question from Sid. Wanted to know that we worship a God who is Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I was thinking, like, are we worshiping the God of Jews, Yahweh? or somebody else, what difference between Jehovah and Yahweh? Both are the names of God. Both are the names of the Father. Uh, in, in Jewish culture, they would, uh, you know, it is the different way, like, you know, both are the same name of God, Jehovah or Yahweh. It is different uh, uh, in Hebrew, I guess they called as Yahweh. And in fact, they used to not call Yahweh. It is in Hebrew, it is known as Yadeh Wade. So uh, even when they write in the scriptures, um, uh, the scribes, when they write in the scripture, they would so fearful to write the name of God. You know, even to write, they used to go, have bath, wash their hands, and then come and write Yahweh each time. And that too, not in the full form. For example, uh, if, the, uh, if the spelling was Y-A-H-W-E-H, they used to write it as y h or a not H, Y hyphen W hyphen H, something like that. They used to miss few letters in between. For example, if they had to, uh, if they had to uh, mention God, they used to not write G O D with a capital G. They used to not write that way. They used to write G hyphen God. So when they read, you know, they used to give all refer reverence to that name. They had so much of fear to the very name of God. Even when it comes to uh, Jehovah, they used to write J-E-H space H, something like that. They used to not write full. They had a lot of reverence and both relates the same. It's the father who is I am. Sid, did that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for the information. Okay. Yes, this is more to... Uh, yes. Please go ahead, Brother Lubega. In fact, it's because of the lack of vowels that we get a combination of names like Jehovah, Yahweh, in the same spelling. Because, you know, the Greeks at, at first... Is it the Greeks? No, the Hebrews. Uh, in the Hebrew language, at first, they were not putting their vowels. So because of that lack of vowels, this is where we get the difference in names. We get Yehovah, we get Yahweh in the same spelling. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Lubega, for adding that. Okay, Sid, maybe one of the reasons that is also there. Anyone else would like to add on to something in today that we studied in line with what we covered today? Before we could close our session with a word of prayer. Okay, I see silence. Okay, well, uh, I hope this was this class was interesting to each one of us and very informative. Uh, so before we could and the session, can I request one of us to please close the session with a word of prayer? Roslyn, can you close the session with a word of prayer?
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Wonderful, Lord Jesus. We want to thank you, Father. Thank you for this wonderful session that we had, Lord. Even, you know, Lord, even or maybe we haven't understood it clearly, but Holy Spirit, we need your guidance. We need your help. Help us, guide us, enlighten our eyes of understanding that we may understand whatever we hear in this session, Lord. And uh, not only be the hearers, but also the, also the doers of the word. Lord, we thank you and we bless our dear pastor. Anoint her, Lord, and use her mightily. Thank you once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining in today's session. See you all tomorrow, same time. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. God bless.